I have not seen the video, but I have been briefed on that video. Um, it is deeply disturbing, uh, uh, let me say horrific from the descriptions I've been given. I have seen the video myself, and I will tell you I was appalled. I'm struggling to find a stronger word, but I will just tell you I was appalled. Laura, do you, you know, what you said this morning on the air about how this video could make the prosecution's case here, do you think we're going to see each of these five officers committing violent acts that justify second-degree murder? As you were explaining, it, you don't have to show intent. You just have to show that they should have had a reasonable belief that their actions would lead to his death. Yeah, that's the standard for second-degree murder in Tennessee, as it is in most places. Intent is not required. These officers did not have to make a plan. They did not have to premeditate. That That's not what we're looking at. Instead, we're looking at a case in which they should have reasonably known, should have been aware that their conduct um, was crossing a line and that a reasonable person in the a reasonable officer's shoes would know that what they were doing would kill Tyree Nichols. It's interesting to hear Garland uh, and Ray there. You can see them trying to strike this delicate balance between being appropriately outraged, if you will, knowing what is to come tonight in this horrific video that everyone has described as horrific. We haven't seen it, but everyone's described it that way. And so they're trying to, you see, clearly strike that balance between bracing for that as, as the nation is calling out for leadership in this moment, but also being mindful that they're in the process of an active federal investigation, as we understand the Justice Department is looking into what happened here. And so I think that that's sort of the line that both Ray and Garland are trying to tow there. But it's also interesting, Andrea, you know, the, the harder issue here is not how do you investigate it, how you prosecute it, how do you prevent cases like this? We've all on this panel covered so many of these cases, too many to count. And the, the real question is, I think, a systemic one. The issues that are going on in Memphis are not unique to Memphis. Um, they're issues that the entire country is struggling with. And we're going to be talking uh, to other people and to exactly to Janae Nelson from the Legal Defense Fund about that very thing. But Tim Alexander, you've worked as a civil rights attorney, a county prosecutor. How much of what happened to Tyree Nichols is systemic within police departments? And do other departments have their versions of this Scorpion Squad, which these officers were part of, which may have been, you know, part of the culture there, a bad part of the culture there? Working in reverse order, uh, yes, a lot of departments have uh, specialized groups to target high crime areas uh, where there's a large amount of calls for services. And oftentimes, not often, sometimes those groups um, form dysfunctional norms, as we say in law enforcement, these beliefs that uh, they, they are slightly outside of the normal operating range of law enforcement. Here, I believe that these officers came in with implicit bias. So it doesn't matter what their ethnicity is, that they're operating, they're seeing people of a certain way. They formed a pretextual reason for stopping the car. And then when that stop didn't go the way they anticipated it, they uh, really became emotionally hijacked. And you see this rage coming out as being described by those who've seen a video that how dare this person not conform in the manner in which they expected him to conform. And that rage and that that, that total loss of uh, where they are, who they are, what they're doing resulted in a loss of life again. And so I believe that this is a huge problem in training, that law enforcement has to accept the fact that implicit bias is ingrained in many departments. That doesn't say that what, what I've been saying along, all along, the vast majority of law enforcement officers are good, honorable people. But when you have situations like this and it comes to a head and we lose life, enough's enough and we must make significant changes. Tim, there's an obvious question here that a lot of people are asking. Here, here is an assault that has been described by those who've seen the video as comparable to the Rodney King brutality, which was a case of a black man being assaulted by white police. And here you have five black police officers. Can you help us explain, just culturally, what happens to these black officers uh, one of whom had apparently a previous incident before he was hired in Memphis in a prison facility where he was accused, of, incredibly accused of a beating. But what happens to people who have a, you know, a uniform and a gun in some cases where uh, five black officers could treat this black man so brutally? 
that that goes right back to the the uh, discussion or, or the uh, topic of implicit bias that these officers see themselves as blue and they see certain people in the community as uh, uh, you know ordinary people and some as as criminals regardless of uh, who they are where they are is ingrained and in this case uh, I believe that they believe they saw this man no matter what as someone who uh, you know across their radar. He must be up to no good, and they came up with this reason to stop the car, and this is what happened. So to, to, to bring it full steam, it doesn't matter the, the race or the ethnicity of the officer. When you're operating with implicit bias, it's how you see the community, how you see people in your community. And if you have these, these biases, then you have this type of reaction. And uh, I believe that is coupled with the emotional hijacking aspect where these officers just lost it because this man did not cooperate. He didn't follow the script that they anticipated. Uh, and they, he, he actually tried to get away from it and, and at one point was quasi successful. And then the rage really just comes out. And no one was there to say, wait a minute, stop. This is wrong. What are we doing here? And in fact, they all jumped on board and beat this man to death based on uh, you know the, the description on the video. That's really the culture of law enforcement that needs to be weeded out. I don't think that it's, it's a widespread, but when it comes out and it comes out like this, uh, it's so damning and so hard, uh, you know, just a heart breaking. I too was a victim of police brutality. So I know the receiving end of that before I became a police officer. And I went through 27 years in law enforcement looking for this type of activity to make sure that it, in, in my arm's reach, that it was addressed immediately and people were disciplined accordingly. And it's just extraordinary. Harry Littman, you worked on the prosecution of the officers involved in the Rodney King beating three decades ago. How do you expect these prosecutors in Tennessee now are going to approach this case? Well, I think compared with Rodney King, which does seem to all of us as the paradigm of a terrible beating, this is going to be worse by orders of magnitude. Rodney King, which seemed to go forever, one minute, 19 seconds. This is over twice as long. It's going to be an eternity. And second, with Rodney King, at least the federal theory was that the initial encounter, as is often the case, was lawful. And at a certain point, it turned unlawful. But if the chief of police has said here that maybe even the initial stop was not justified, so that would mean the entire three minutes is just a savage free-for-all. In terms of the one thing you can say about prosecutors, I do think that, that um, people in Tennessee, Memphis, across the country are more now attuned to the possibility of this kind of savagery from um, police officers not as inclined to automatically give them the benefit of the doubt. Laura pointed out the charge of second degree murder. I got to say it's going to they had to bring it and I'm glad they did, but they to show that it was reasonably certain that these people who were in, emotionally engaged as the chief just said were, you know, knew that they were beating him, that could be a challenge and everyone will be holding their breath when it does come to the trial. But by all accounts, this is going to be the worst thing by far we have ever seen in this country as a video. It's just terrifying. Oh, Laura Jarrett, there are some in some cities like L.A., at Pittsburgh, where the police have pushed back against it, where they're trying to, to prevent the police, well, by order, the police do not handle routine, you know, harmless traffic stops mm. to try to reduce the possibility of these kinds of interactions. Yeah, we certainly have seen different levels of police reforms used throughout the country, and some of these exper experiments have been successful. Some of uh, them haven't. I think one of the issues that's going to come up uh, as we do a deeper dive on what exactly happened here is the use of this so-called Scorpion Squad and how exactly prepared were these individual officers, uh, what exactly, what level of training did they go through? It, it appears as though they hadn't been on the force very long. Long. I think that's an issue um, you're going to hear more about, and just the general atmosphere of what happens when you have these sort of jump-out squads, what happens in the community when you have a situation like that, sort of the level of dangerousness, um, I think you're going you're to hear a lot more about, Andrea.